Okay, can folks hear me now? Ah, fantastic. It wouldn't be a tech talk without technical issues. <laughs> um, great, so how's it going folks? Uh, my name is Nina Zakarenko and today you're gonna learn the basics of programming hardware with Python. Uh, the slides are available online, so you can grab a copy to follow along. There's lots of information available throughout, a lot of helpful resources. Um, note that on Speaker Deck, you'll have to download the slides as a PDF in order to be able to click through to the links. Um, so, who am I? Um, my name is Nina Zakarenko. You can find me on... Um, Twitch at NNJAIO. I also tweet at NNJA. Um, same on GitHub. I also block at uh, Nina.to. I've been a software engineer now for over a decade. Uh, for the past two years, I've had the pleasure of working on the cloud developer advocacy team at Microsoft as a Python cloud developer advocate focused on making Azure and VS Code a pleasure to use for developers everywhere. And um, I'm gonna talk to you about where to start when you're just getting started. So what your hardware options might be, um, what you need to know about programming LEDs, uh, debugging with print. We're gonna talk about some tools, some libraries, um, and I'm gonna show you some projects. And if we're lucky and if all the hardware works, I also have some live demos to show today. Um, Y'all have no idea how much stuff I have on my desk right now, like between the streaming and the hardware. Um, it's just a party. And um, here are some of my projects that I've been working on. Uh, so I've been doing software for a long time. I only recently started uh, playing with hardware and I instantly fell in love with it because I've always been wary of like, the ephemeral nature of software. You know, you can't hold it in your hand, you can't touch it. Uh, hardware is a little bit different. It's really just, uh, you can create a physical manifestation of your code. And I really love the idea of LEDs and making cool wearable projects. Um, and I wanted to make pretty things that fit my aesthetic, which is what got me interested in the first place. So hardware lets me be creative, it lets me imagine something and then bring that imagination to life. Uh, the second project is like a big LED headdress with flowers um, and all of that. Uh, and I've been amazed by shared projects by a lot of um, great makers like Becky Stern and Sophie Wong. Uh, there are tons and tons of hardware options available. I'm only gonna cover a few. Um, some might be a Raspberry Pi Zero, which is a small development kit with wireless and Bluetooth connectivity, uh, the BBC Microbit, which is a computing device aimed at learning, um, and then the Adafruit has an M0 and M4 line of devices, as well as ones that support uh, Bluetooth, and then a lot more. So on the left-hand side is the Raspberry Pi Zero W. Um, it's a small development kit. The BBC Microbit is in the middle, and the interesting thing about that is it was given free to every child uh, around age 11 across the UK in 2016. And then on the right is an Adafruit device. Um, I'm going to be focusing on Adafruit today. Uh, I'm not affiliated, but I am a big fan. It's a woman owned company that is based in New York and um, Adafruit really prides themselves on documentation. So they have a lot of um, really great free guides. But I'm not the only one who's been inspired by playing with hardware. Uh, in a, a study of the microbit, 90% of students said that the microbit showed them that anyone can code. 86% of students said that the microbit made computer science more interesting. And 70% more girls said that they would choose computing as a school subject after using the microbit. So it's pretty rad. Um, I'm gonna be talking about the Adafruit Circuit Playground Express today. Uh, it's a learning platform, it costs about $25, and depending on when and where you purchased it, it may come with CircuitPython installed by default or not. If it doesn't, I'm gonna show you how easy it is to get set up to run um, Python. And it's really my favorite option for an introduction to electronics and programming hardware. Now, 
Python has this batteries included um, philosophy. There's a proposal, PEP 206, that says uh, that the Python source distribution has maintained a philosophy of batteries included, having a rich and versatile standard library, which is immediately available without making the user download separate packages. This gives the Python language a head start in many projects. And I think that this has really helped drive Python's success. Now, the Circuit Playground Express doesn't actually come with batteries, but I imagine that the same philosophy applies because it has everything that you need to get started programming hardware, including uh, included on just one board. So a little bit of a tour of what's on it. There are 10, uh, NeoPixel RGB LEDs, which can display 16 million colors. Um, NeoPixel is an Adafruit specific name for a type of uh, LED called the WS2812. And each one of these 10 RGB LEDs actually has three teeny tiny LEDs contained inside of it. Um, and we'll, we'll dive into that in just a second. Uh, each one can display about 16 million colors. There's a light sensor, temperature sensor, there's programmable buttons uh, in a switch, an accelerometer to detect motion, there's a tiny little speaker and a microphone. Uh, there are input and output pads around the sides. Uh, some support capacitive touch. Uh, there's flash memory, so programs are saved on the device even if it's not connected to a power source. You can store small files on it, like sound clips. Uh, micro USB jack, so it's easy to program and a lot more. But best of all, there's no soldering required. So you don't have to handle uh, a hot soldering iron in order to add any of these components on. And you can easily connect other things to it with alligator clips uh, like LED strips once you're ready to uh, move on. Now, MicroPython and CircuitPython, I see a lot of folks get confused about these two. Uh, MicroPython is a variant of Python 3 that is designed to run on my con controllers. And uh, it's compact enough to fit and run with in just uh, 256 kilobytes of code space and 16 kilobytes of RAM. It's what runs on the micro bit. Um, so very focused on performance and portability. CircuitPython is an education-friendly fork of MicroPython. Um, it used to target mostly just Adafruit devices, but in the past uh, year, they've really opened up their platform. Uh, and since I'm gonna be showing demos on Adafruit hardware, I'm gonna be using CircuitPython in this case, but know that both are open source, so if you're interested in uh, contributing, it's a great opportunity. Now, there are a lot of different CircuitPython libraries available for things like programming LEDs or interacting with sensors. Um, some of them are built in, some aren't, but the ones that aren't built in need to be included on a lib folder in the device. Um, we're interested in the library for the Circuit Playground Express that lets us easily interact with the board. You can download all the libraries from git.io slash circuitpythonlib uh, and we're gonna be using this library. So here's an example of using the library. Uh, we import the library as CPX, and then we can interact with the two buttons. One is on the left-hand side lab labeled A. You can kind of see that in a little arrow in the red circle. The other is on the right-hand side labeled B, and we can now access them with cpx.button underscore A, which will return true when the button is pressed and false otherwise, uh, same for button B. Um, so it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Now, in order to understand how to work with LEDs, um, you really kind of have to understand a little bit about the RGB color space. So each RGB LED, what we might refer to as a NeoPixel, actually has uh, three tiny LEDs inside of it. One is red, one is green, and one is blue, and they can light up with different intensities. So take a look at the color wheel on the right-hand side. By combining the amount and the intensity of these colors, uh, each from a range of 0 to 255, you can produce over 16 million color variations. 
Now, zero means that the color is not present or it's completely off. And 255 means that it's set to the maximum intensity. So if you had red set to 255 and green set to zero and blue set to zero, that LED would light up red, pure red. Now, if we look at the color wheel and we lit up the red LED at 255, the green LED at 255, and the blue LED at zero, that would produce the blended color yellow to our eye once we zoomed out of these teeny tiny LEDs. Okay, it's a little bit easier to understand if you see it working. Uh, here's a, a NeoPixel that is zoomed in. And in order to understand what's happening, take a look at the color of the outside ring, because that's gonna really reflect um, what you'll see with your naked eye. Uh, when all of the LEDs are on, you'll actually see white. When all of the LEDs are off, you'll see black. And then there are the different steps in between. So if just the red LED is on, that circle will be red. So pretty cool. And I didn't understand this when I first started working with LEDs. And this really helped me um, solidify my understanding. Now, we have a pretty simple program that's going to cycle through red, green, and blue with a button press. And uh, let's quickly walk through this code step by step and see what it does. Um, first, we're importing that CPX library that we were talking about earlier. Then we're importing time. And we're defining our colors in RGB values. Um, again, the order here is red, green, and blue. And notice where the 255s are and where the zeros are. Then we're going to make a list of all of the colors we want to loop through and pick a position of zero to start with. I'm also bumping down the brightness to 0 0.1 because um, these LEDs are very, very bright. And if anybody runs this code on their own device, I don't want you to be like blinded by the light. Um, and then instead of only running our code once, we kind of want to think of it as an animation. So we want to loop forever. Um, so that we can constantly check for input. So we're going to fill all of the pixels with the selected color and um, we're going to listen to button presses. So either the left or the right button, button A or button B. We'll switch the position and then we're going to sleep for just a fifth of the second to um, make the button presses less sensitive. And the idea of this is called debouncing. So um, I have the code open on the device right now. And we'll see that the device is connected to my computer under um, volumes circuit py. The nice thing is, um, as I work on this code in my editor, um, once I save it, it's automatically saved on the device and the code is rerun. So that really decreases the um, development cycle. And let me all know if um, you can see this, but um, I have a circuit playground device right here on my desk. Let's see if I can bring it up to this camera without knocking everything over. So it's right here. Um, and it is running the same code that we just looked at. And so when I click on these buttons, you'll see the LEDs changing color. And that was um, pretty straightforward. And I think, you know, really the code is really easy to understand. Okay. Now, <laughs> I have a few recorded videos in case um, my demos don't work. Okay, so how do we program this? Well, uh, it's a lot easier than working with some of the older Arduino based platforms. Like for those of you that have tried it, that means uh, no AVR dude errors. You don't have to time pressing the reset button, you know, like just right or it's not going to work. Um, all you need to do is plug it in with a known good data and charge USB cable. Um, a lot of USB cables are charge only, so you have to be careful. Um, if you plug it in with a USB cable that supports data, you'll see it show up on your computer like a drive, like we saw earlier. 
Um, you don't want to unplug or reset the board before your computer finishes writing the file because otherwise you can corrupt the drive. Um, and the CircuitPython drive is going to show up on Mac OS or Linux in volumes slash CircuitPy like you saw on my machine. Um, on Windows, I think it just shows up as a separate drive. Um, if you don't see that CircuitPython drive, you're going to have to walk through the steps of installing CircuitPython on your device, which is pretty straightforward. Um, and then next you're going to edit and save a code.py file, which is the one that gets picked up automatically, and your, own, your code is just going to run instantly. Which is super nice. It's a really nice quick workflow. Um, and then if you don't have CircuitPython installed, this is just like a sped up video of what you need to do. Um, you need to download um, the, uh, I forget exactly what these files are called, but they're UF2 files and you have to put the device uh, into bootloader mode and basically reflash it. And if you missed all that, don't worry, just follow the link in the slides. Now, um, personally, I like uh, programming my devices with Visual Studio Code and the Python extension uh, because that's already what I use for Python. Um, really, you, your safest bet is to use an editor that writes out the whole file completely when you save it. Um, and you don't have to worry about waiting for save. Um, so VS Code does that out of the box. And I really like the Python extension features. It has great autocomplete. There's an integrated terminal and a whole lot more. You can also use uh, an editor called Mew, which is a simple Python editor for beginner programmers. If you're um, maybe just getting started with Python or hardware and um, it just kind of has a simple set of buttons at the top that let you run the code and um, load files, etc. So dealer's choice. Uh, sometimes you need to figure out what's going on under the hood. And because this device is connected as a drive, um, if you print stuff out, you can't, there's no way of seeing it without taking a few extra steps. So how do we investigate with print statements? Well, I, um, updated my code a little bit. So I added some labels here for the colors of red, green, and blue. And um, I keep looping forever. I fill my color. Um, I hit my button press. And then I print something out to keep track of the previous and the next colors. Uh, so in order to see these print statements, you need to communicate with um, the device by opening a connection to the serial console, which is gonna receive output from your CircuitPython board that's sent over USB so that you can see it. Uh, this is also helpful for troubleshooting errors because your board is gonna send errors and uh, the serial console will print those out too. So let's take a look at that. So here's some code that I had um, in the demo with the labels. And in order to connect to your, your device via serial console, um, you need to, well, there's a few options. In Mew, there's a, a really simple button that you can press to connect to the serial console. If you're a little bit more comfortable, you can do so via um, a program called Screen. And so um, you'd wanna list out your TTY devices. Um, you might have a lot of them. Uh, any Bluetooth devices connected to your computer would be listed out here. So it's helpful to grep for the term USB. And then you would grab this whole thing and connect to this session via screen. So now let's take a look at our device. 
Now when I hit these buttons, you'll see um, our print statements right here. So changing the color from blue to red, from red to green, etc. And uh, while we're in here, maybe we can add a new color as well. Um, so let's add purple. And pop quiz, um, what combination of colors mixed together makes purple? So that's gonna be uh, red and blue. So we have red set to 255, green set to zero, and then blue set to 255 to make purple. And if we save this, it should uh, auto reload. And now we'll see that output. And let's try this again. So changing our color from red to green, from green to blue, and then from blue to purple. It's kind of hard to see the purple a little bit. Let's see if I can get a light going, that will help. This will either help or hinder. But you can kind of see we, we've got a new color combination going on. So, um, make that go away. Uh, here's what the button might look like in Mu. This is really the easiest way. Um, here's a little demo of what that might look like. It will pop it open and you'll see the output. Um, for advanced serial console, use the terminal or there's a lot of other standalone programs that you can use uh, like cool term and ones that are available for windows. Uh, one last thing that I forgot to mention is the most important thing about using screen is how to quit screen. I'm gonna teach you how to quit screen because uh, that's something that frustrates folks um, pretty regularly. So in order to quit screen, um, you'll see that it, uh, like I can press enter here and nothing happens. It's capturing my input. Um, so if I wanted to quit, I would have to press control A followed by K, which will pop up a little dialog that asks if I really want to kill this window. And I'm going to say yes. And then I'll see that screen is terminating. So <laughs> that might be the most important takeaway from, from the talk today. Um, my demo this is thankfully working, so I can skip my video. Okay, so um, so far I've been powering this by USB connected to my computer, which is the easiest option uh, because you probably already have a micro USB cable, or you know maybe uh, if you wanted to make your project portable, you can just charge it into a, uh, plug it into a phone charging battery. Um, you can also power your projects with battery packs. Uh, you need a minimum of 3.5 volts to run the device. Um, so one AAA battery is 1.5 volts and you'll need uh, three of them to power the device with uh, something that looks like this. And there is a um, a special port on this called a JST port, which is kind of just right here on the bottom. Let's see if I can get that to focus. Um, that you plug that little white plug into. Um, so you can either charge or uh, power it from the micro USB port or from a battery pack using a JST connector. There's another option for powering your projects um, called LiPoly batteries or LiPo batteries. Um, these are small and lightweight and energy dense. Um, so a lot of energy in a small package. But know that they are for advanced users only because they're pretty fragile. Um, they can be dangerous if they're short or if they're damaged. Um, they need special care. So I think for that reason, the Circuit Playground Express doesn't come with charging circuitry for LiPoly batteries. So you'll need to buy your own charger and make sure that it's suitable for your battery's capacity. Um, these come with some special protection circuitry as well. Um, it, and 
they're difficult to ship and dispose of. So make sure that you do your research and you only buy these from a reputable source. Um, now, putting all of this together, uh, I have some, some Adafruit demo code loaded up on um, another device on my desk. Um, so this one um, goes through kind of the full RGB spectrum. There's a nice animation. Um, if you hit the switch here, you can also um, use the capacitive touchpads on the sides for tone piano, which is pretty fun. Um, so this was some example demo code from Adafruit that goes through a lot of the features of the Circuit Playground Express, and I linked to it here. Um, there are other options if you want to get started programming hardware with zero coding. One is Microsoft Make Code, which includes a built-in emulator that allows you to use um, kind of like a scratch-based, block-based interface for programming it. Something else um, that is really fantastic and pretty new is the VS Code Device Simulator Express extension, which allows you to run CircuitPython without the hardware. Uh, which is fantastic because a lot of folks might not be able to afford the hardware at the moment. Uh, for a while, Adafruit wasn't shipping because they're based in New York. Uh, so this VS Code extension was built by the interns at Microsoft, and it simulates a few different um, hardware platforms, one being the Circuit Playground Express, another being the Microbit, uh, and they also recently added a support for the Adafruit Clue, which is a, a much more advanced device with a screen and um, can allow you to toggle the sensors and a lot more. Yep. Uh, so let me show you that extension real quick. Um, I already have it installed from the store. Um, So let's enable that. And let's see if this one works. Okay, so you'll get uh, the simulator, the device right here. Um, I can run this code and let's see if it decides to work on me. There we go. So there's my red, my green, my blue. So this is an opportunity to learn about hardware uh, without having a device at all. The hardware community is awesome about sharing incredible projects uh, with step-by-step -step instructions. So there's Adafruit guides, Microsoft Make Code Instructables. Um, so your next steps are buy, borrow a device of your choice or use an emulator or a simulator, pick your editor like VS Code, etc. write your code, use the library, or start with a shared project. Uh, and hopefully you've seen that Python opens up a whole new world of working with wearable electronics. Um, I'm actually wearing one of my projects today. We'll see if I can get this working. So uh, my earrings run Python, <laughs> which I think is pretty fun. Um, and I also have a jacket that I made. Um, that runs Python as well. Uh, it's hard to see the links, but they are git.io slash pi earrings for the earrings and then git.io slash LED underscore jacket for the jacket. And thank you all so much. Uh, it's really been a pleasure giving this talk. I hope I've left you inspired that now you know how to program LEDs with Python. You can light up your life with code and creativity. Uh, you can learn more about Python at Microsoft at nina.to slash lcc-microsoft. Um, please follow me on Twitter, NNJA. Check out my code streams on Twitch at NNJAIO. And thank you all so much. <laughs>